when people are feeling that they are under incredible strain and stress in the moment. Now, we've got an election coming up, and I'm not going to get political, but we are feeling strain and stress at the moment. To get extremely real and, and, and close to modern times, if you went to a football game last night, maybe you're feeling strain and stress in the moment. Maybe you feel like it is apocalypse and the world is coming to an end. There is always a time and a place that we feel our world is crumbling around us. Whether it's at a small scale or a big scale, we are always going to encounter those moments where the world feels like it's falling apart around us. And that nothing we say or do feels like it has an impact on what the world does around us. And for those early churches and those early Christians living in a world that was not shaped and formed around them in which they were regarded as lesser beings and not necessarily as authentic people, they knew certainly what it was to feel like the world is falling apart around them and crumbling and they have no option and they don't have a way forward. John wrote to them, and John still speaks to us through this prophetic message that it is indeed words of hope, still, even still. But they are words that have to be born in the context of this word, and it is a word that is considered a bad word among some people in my church. Patience. Ooh, it hurts. No one enjoys being patient. I don't think. But patience and hope are often tied and intertwined very closely together. And I know that I started this moment with saying that Revelation can be summed up in those sentences of how do we get in the mess that we're in and how is God going to fix it? But sprinkled all through those sentences and those statements are two other very important understandings that John communicated to those churches and by extension to us today. He goes, no matter where you are or what's going on, I need you to remember two things, early churches and early Christians, and by extension, us today, that God still reigns and God still wins. For those people, that was not assured in their minds most of the time. They saw all of those around them doing all the things they didn't need to be doing and seeing them as the ones that were prospering and the ones that were more comfortable and the ones that seemed to be more aligned to the best of life. John tells them to remain patient, that God still reigns and God still wins. I know how it looks and seems right now. It seems like you can't get out of your own way. It seems like everything may be working against you. But God still reigns and God still wins. And there is never a time where we don't need that blessed assurance. There will never be a time that we don't need to know that and to hear that on repeat, if you will. God still reigns. God still wins. It was needed then. It is needed now. God still reigns, and God still wins. That is a revelation. Let it breathe into us life and hope and give us patience to persist in telling the story of who we are and of whose we are. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we can get lost in the surroundings of life, in the ebbs and flows that the currents of our circumstances seem to take us. We are thankful for the assurances that we are given 
those that are clear and those that are more mysterious and are harder to discern, but we are told and we are reminded that you, Father, you still reign and that you still win. The Spirit still reigns and the Spirit still wins. The Son still reigns and the Son still wins. Help us to be mindful of that. Help us to guard that in our hearts and to be guided by it. And let us walk into the next moments where we find ourselves in the strength of that assurance. Let us keep faith in faith. Amen. As we are affirmed by that, I ask for you to arise and let us join together in this affirmation of faith that we proudly and with strength lift our voices and utter together these words that are found in the bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. prepare ourselves for the offering this morning, and let us do so with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we have been gifted by the hearing of your word. We have been gifted by the presence of one another and by the presence of this moment and this space. As we have been blessed with these gifts and others, let us give this time an opportunity to give back a portion of those gifts so that we too can share in the telling and the showing of your story. Amen.
Father, we have received these gifts. Let them be for the benefit and for the sharing and the showing and the telling of your story and our part in it and for those who have yet to find their place in the story, that opportunity to explore and find their role and their part in the sharing of it as well. Let these gifts bless and go beyond these walls today in the power and the glory and the authority of your word, now and forever. Amen. an announcement, don't be shy. Come on. I have uh, two tickets to Charlotte's Web on Friday, September the 27th, 7 p.m. It's part of the Lyceum series and I'll be out of town, so I won't be able to go. So anyone who would like these, please come to me and take them. Because I hate to waste it. It's too good. We are doing Sunday school now, uh, adult Sunday school, after church. And we've been meeting at McAllister's. And uh, we've had a lot of fun with it, and uh, it's been uh, pretty well received. Natalie started this, but today I'm wondering about the weather, and uh, so 
Tom, Tom Ritter has, is in charge of it today. If you uh, are planning on going, would you please tell me or Tom that you will be there? Because we may call it off if we don't have enough people. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm, um, I'm Rex O'Neill. I'm the senior patrol leader of um, Troop 27, the, um, the Boy Scout troop that's right, uh, that meets right in there Mondays. And um, we're looking for um, old fishing equipment, just fishing equipment that you don't want anymore. So um, just bring that over if, you'd, if you do have any fishing equipment that you don't want. Thanks. Good morning, I'm Katie Foster, the youth group coordinator. And I just wanted to remind everyone that we meet at five o'clock tonight, um, ages 12 to 18. So please come join us, we have a lot of fun. All right, see ya. Next Sunday, <coughs> the choir would like to have the children join them in the anthem. So uh, if you will tell all the people who are not here that uh, with children that uh, this will happen and we'll have more about it. Uh, I'll send out messages about it. But we're gonna have the children sing Jesus Loves Me next Sunday. Thanks. I was wondering if we wanted to go ahead and sing Amazing Grace in Choctaw or Cherokee. Um, it's in the bullet, it's in the hymnals. I just didn't know if anybody wanted to attempt that. I think Korean may be in there too. We could. I've threatened my congregations before with trying to do that, and, and, and they have the same blank reluctance to, to do that as well. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here this morning. I've, I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, it, it, is a, it is a different experience and perspective again. I can't stress that enough. Um, but I am truly thankful um, for this opportunity, for a, a homecoming of sorts. Um, I'm very thankful for it. Um, if there are no other announcements that need to be made, let us close this time together and let us go forth in peace for fellowship time across the hallway. So let us do that. Gracious Father, until we have the chance and opportunity to gather again, let us go in the peace and the comfort and the warmth of your guiding love. Let us shalom until we have the chance to gather again. Amen. And then it was copied for they can have a copy, but then it was sent ahead to the next church to be read to that assembled body aloud to make sure no one misunderstood what was being shared. But it also meant each other church got to hear about each other's laundry. So you didn't get to hide what was going on in your church. These other churches knew everything about one another, which was kind of an interesting way to 
usher a sense of accountability, but it also, in hearing about these problems that these churches faced, it relates to us even still today, about what they faced in the world around them and how they were given some guidance and advice on how to navigate that world. But consider again where John is writing from in the world that John is writing in. And John has to disguise what he's saying with a lot of imagery and symbolism so that those who are reading it that may not need to have been reading it, that weren't the intended audience, weren't finding an immediate reason to go execute him. So it's so full of imagery and symbology. It's like, it's like when you're reading Shakespeare and you know that there are hidden jokes there that the audience would have gotten at the time, but, but we are centuries removed and we just don't quite appreciate the subtleties of it. So the best way to walk into Revelation is this. Revelation doesn't necessarily mean what it says. It means what it means. And that can be hard when you try to tease out the words of understanding what it means when you get bogged down by the words that it's using to say it. It'd be just a little less crazy than Nero, but not by much. And maybe in a different way. He was a different kind of crazy. But was so similar that most people at the time called him a second to Nero. That gives you a little bit of context about the Roman emperor and the empire at the time. Domitian was so special in how he regarded himself that he declared a break from the tradition of the time and demanded that the empire worship him as a living God. Most Roman emperors were, were deified after their death. But Domitian decided to one-up the game and said, no, no, you can, you can go ahead and give me all those accolades now. It was so shocking at the time that there are even contemporary Roman authors who essentially said he is... Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, this is a different perspective for me. <laughs> so I, I am so thankful um, and happy to be back here at Trinity um, from times away. And uh, it, is, it is definitely um, a different feel right from this perspective. So I am glad to be here this morning. I'm glad that you all extended the invitation for me to be here, and I'm glad to share this time of worship with you this morning. So as I like to do back at my home church um, down near the summit area of Mississippi, everyone taking a deep breath and just let it out and let that ground us to this moment and to this place. And let us be thankful that we are here together to worship and here together to celebrate whose we are and to celebrate who we are. So with that, let us pray to begin this time of worship. Gracious and loving Father, we come into this space, into this moment, and we pause. We pause to be still and to be connected in the power of your presence and the presence of one another, Father. To be mindful of who we are and to be mindful and to celebrate whose we are. Let our voices and our hearts, let our whole selves be in tune to the power of your presence as we are here to celebrate and be thankful for being part of your family this morning. Amen.
please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship uh, as printed in your bulletin. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is our God, the one who loves us and who gave himself for us, who gathers us together in this place and bids us seek his face. Let us worship God together. Now let's sing together our opening hymn, Holy, 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 number one. As we have lifted up our voices in song and reminded ourselves of God's creation and our part and place in it, let us come into this time being thankful and being humble for the quiet times in which we can reflect on the times where we have been, on the times where we are, and the times that we're traveling into. We often exist in a state of tension between who we are called to be and where we feel we find ourselves. Reconciliation can be a time of stress and pain but can also is a time of growth, a time of motion. As we walk into this time of reconciliation with the struggles that we are in, 
the struggles that have crafted our unique stories of who we are at this very moment. Let us be thankful for the journeys where we have gone through, for the journey where we are, and for our future journeys to come. We ask for guidance and to be guarded through that journey. And most of all, we seek forgiveness even if we can't find the words to express it. We are thankful for a Father who has endless mercy and compassion and patience for us. With that understanding, let us join together in this prayer of forgiveness and offer our thanksgiving to our Father. Thank you for your endless mercy and for teaching us the importance of forgiveness. Help us to forgive ourselves for our own shortcomings and failures. Recognizing that we are all works in progress. May we seek to understand the perspectives and experiences of those who have wronged us, fostering empathy and compassion. Guide us to build bridges of reconciliation and to heal broken relationships with humility and grace. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we break the silence, be assured of this and remember and hear the good news again of a Savior who died for us. That indescribable gift that was, is, and forever shall be offers us a way to be brought into the fold, offers us a way of getting past the ways that we often trip our own selves up. We have been given that assurance, and it is indeed a blessed assurance. Let us be thankful for that, thankful for the family that we can call ours. And let us express that thankfulness as we offer this time to pass the peace among one another. Thank you so much for, for taking the children to Walter, it's been a while since I've seen you. I have been gone a lot in the summer, so I haven't seen a lot of these people. So it's nice to see you again. If you were listening really closely, which you might not have been, earlier in our call to worship, there were a couple of words that you might not know. One of them is, says, 
alpha, and the other one is omega. And God says he is the alpha and the omega. These, those are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. So this is alpha, looks like our A, and this is omega. And um, so God says he's the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. What do you think he means by that? Got any idea? No? He also says that he is the one who has always been, who is, and will always will be. So he's saying, God is saying, and I say he, but we don't know. I mean, God isn't a man or a woman. God is just God. He says that he is eternal, which means he has always been God, and he will always be God. And that's, that's kind of weird, a weird thing for us to think about because everything that we know and every body that we know is, gonna, is not going to last. It's not going to last forever. Scientists even say that in a few billion years, the sun is going to run out of fuel and won't shine anymore. So even the stars in the sky won't last forever. Compared to us, they last forever, but they won't last forever and ever. So that's a really weird thing to think about. So I have a special cross that I like to wear and it has, this kind of shows you, it has an A, the alpha, and it has the omega, and they're both on top of a cross. So it's kind of talking about God and Jesus also as being forever and ever, and he loves us, and he he will love us forever, which is pretty strange idea, too, because we don't often act very lovable. But so uh, let's, we'll just say a little prayer then. Dear God, thank you. Oh, thank you for loving us forever. Thank you for loving us forever. Amen. Okay, thank you.
as we prepare to receive and to hear our first lesson this morning from the Old Testament, please join with me in this prayer for illumination. Open wide the window of our spirits, O Lord, and fill us full of light. Open wide the door of our hearts, that we may receive and entertain you with all our powers of adoration and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah in chapter 41, the first four verses. Listen now to these words. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to wind-blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. Our second reading comes from the book of Revelation, the first chapter, in its entirety. Listen now to these words. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. 
Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the serpent, the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I begin this time, we are traveling through the whole letter of Revelation in my home church. And as I always say at the start, at any time I share the word, it's just a little light reading. Just a little light reading. Revelation is full of enigma and mystery and symbols and metaphors, and it it is a hard place to journey through. And like most things, if, if those who, who know me best, I, I'm a person who is grounded in context. I went to school to study archaeology and history, and context matters a whole lot to me, and it's needed to fully appreciate what John of Patmos was trying to write to those seven churches and what was happening in the world that surrounded John at the time. And so that's why the front of your bulletin is a map showing where Patmos is and where the seven churches were, and to understand where this was in the time of early Christians. Now, it is hard to understand Revelation. It is full of of dragons and horses and riders and beasts and more beasts and seven heads and ten horns and all of this stuff. And it is heavy, heavy. But the most profound thing that we can know from Revelation that it is a message. It is a message and it is very profound in what it is meant to deliver and relate. Revelation can be summed up in two sentences. How did we come to find ourselves in the mess that we are in? And how is God going to fix the mess that we have found ourselves to be in? That's essentially what Revelation is all about in those simple sentences. But when you think about Revelation, most people associate Revelation with one word. And that word is apocalypse. Now, when you hear about apocalypse, what most often comes to mind? Destruction, devastation, Doom and gloom, annihilation, that, that's what comes to mind with apocalypse. And for John of Patmos, it was not really a description of those kinds of things. It was being a prophetic vision that he was relating. It is his intent to unveil something important, something deeper, a deeper truth that we need to hear. Because all prophetic 
messages all the way from the Old Testament through all of time. They are intended to deliver a truth, to guide us and instruct us and to encourage and to maybe even warn us about who God is and what God is doing. So, like I said, I like context, so to kind of ground us in what Revelation is really all about, let us dig a little bit deeper into what Revelation is and who wrote it, where it was written, when it was written, and what its intended audience might have heard. So, who wrote John? Well, he does the benefit for us all these years later of saying, I, John, this witness at Patmos. So that's great. We know it's John. We know Patmos. That's an island. That's in the sea that's right beside Asia Minor, which would be modern-day western Turkey, which would have been at that time the Roman Empire. So John is in isolation and seclusion. He has been banished there because of what he has said and who he has testified to in a Roman world, because what he said in a Roman world wasn't very popular. I don't like the Roman emperor. I don't like the Roman pantheon. I, I follow this other guy. And this other faith is what I ascribe to. And they said, well, we're going to put you in a nice, quiet, isolated place where you can really think about what it is that you're saying. And that's where John is. John is in perpetual timeout, if you will. And he's fortunate just to be in perpetual timeout.